So we just talked a little bit about um, the five aspects of inclusive leadership. Let's delve into to each of those aspects. So first, when we talk about this idea of inclusive uh, hiring managers and, 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 and teams. So why do you think hiring managers and selection teams need to have these five aspects of inclusive leadership? So that becomes an important question to answer. And so it's our hope that through the rest of this course, we'll, we'll answer that question. So we'll talk about the, the, the leadership concepts. We'll talk about diversity and inclusion tips, addressing culture fit bias. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about how to reduce uh, bias in the selection process. So first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about this inclusive mindset. And so an inclusive mindset really is one that enables leaders to have a vested interest in each employee and be ready to leverage their expertise, their strengths, their talents, to make everyone feel like they can bring their whole and best selves to work, right? And so this inclusive leader really looks for those opportunities searches out the, those strengths so that they can maximize so that people can feel like they can bring their best and whole selves to work. Next, we, we'll talk a little bit about cultural competence and agility. We'll spend a little more time here, and I think you'll see why in just a second. So when we talk about this idea of cultural competence and agility, uh, what I'd like for you to do is, before we even get to the text, is just look at these two, these two pictures. And the, the question is, uh, for some of you, you may see th that in the top picture, there is a picture of a bird with something in its mouth. And on the bottom, there is a, a person um, next to a, a big fish uh, in front of an island with two trees. Um, and there are birds off in the distance, right? So, so it, it waves in the distance. So the, the, the question is, how is it possible that both of those images can exist, right? Well, the truth is, obviously, that both images are, in fact, the same picture. But if you don't have cultural competence, you might not see the other aspects, right? So as as, as you're working with groups of people, they may see aspects that you that are foreign to you. And so when we think about this idea of being having cultural competence and agility, it really is the, this idea that leaders can effectively manage anxiety, misunderstandings, or conflicts caused by the uncertainty in cross-cultural interactions by means of mindfulness, empathy, knowledge, and uh, about cultural varieties, right? So it's this idea that the leader has an awareness about how to be flexible, how to engage, um, not necessarily having to know everything about every culture, but they do have enough savvy um, to, to recognize that context and, and cultures uh, specific context and specific cultures demand specific responses, right? And the most culturally competent thing one can do when encountering a um, a culture uh, or a cultural mindset that that is not familiar to to one is to ask about it, right? And 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 how you ask about that becomes extremely important as well. So we'll, we'll keep going. We're going to talk a little bit about greater adaptability, how it is and why it is that leaders need to be adaptable. And why do you think that is? Yes, because the only constant is change. And so when we think about this cultural adaptability, it becomes important, important for leaders to uh, be willing to adjust their leadership style in response to what what works best for the organization and their team, as well as the context that the organization finds itself in, right? So if context is constantly changing and organizations are constantly changing, it, it demands that leaders have the ability to adapt to that context, right? And so as, as you look at this, this picture of the, the six and the nine, it becomes very clear what the problem is. The problem is that folks aren't able to see the other person's perspective yet. What we recognize is that as communication goes up, conflict goes down, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, so we'll talk more about this idea of greater adaptability. Um, unconscious bias and, and cognitive control. Um, it, it is 
It is the leader's responsibility to recognize that decisions can be made under the influence of unconscious or implicit bias, and that they could unfairly impact employees in terms of their recruiting, their performance reviews, promotions, succession plannings, uh, engagement, and retention. Unconscious bias, not doing it on purpose, right? But but it's something that we have to recognize. Uh, if I bump into someone um, while driving my car, I may not have minted on purpose, it may have been a part of my blind spot that I, I didn't I didn't check out, but I will be held responsible for that, right? And the interesting thing about our 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 unconscious bias is that it will also make sense of things that don't necessarily make sense. And so here's an example, uh, just looking at this elephant, what is problematic uh, with, with this particular elephant diagram? And I'll give you just a second to think about that. I think many of you got it right when I show this, the, this slide, that the elephant has five legs, right? Or six legs, depending on how you're, how you're looking at that. So, so our minds can make sense of things or make judgments about things that actually don't make sense. And so we have to take responsibility for those things. We have to tease those things out and we have to check and balance those things against uh, either other people's perspective, uh, perceptions or, uh, or against a list of criteria that we've already set. But we'll talk about that in just a second. I do want to talk about the difference between implicit bias and unconscious bias, because oftentimes people try to use them interchangeably and for certain aspects and in certain contexts, you can use them interchangeably. But, but primarily the difference to note between unconscious bias and implicit bias is that unconscious bias typically is an individual's act, right? So, so I walk as an individual with or operate in the world with unconscious bias. Now, when that unconscious bias becomes a part of an institution, um, or an organization, then it becomes implicit bias because that bias has now become an, uh, a, a staple, uh, a stable aspect of how that organization looks at diversity and inclusion, right? And so implicit bias is organizational and, and, it, and it, it becomes less about an individual's um, preferences or whatnot, but the, the institution itself ha operates with these unconscious bias. For, for example, um, all too often, we're not clear about why we have certain standards in in our workplaces, right? So, so an, an example could be a, a four-year degree, right? So, what are the assumptions that we're having about a four-year degree given a particular uh, job, right? So, so are there some assumptions that we've built into that? And is it possible that th that just having a four year degree doesn't necessarily yield us the results that we want in terms of people's behavior? But we'll talk more about that it, it, later. So, so, so it, it, is it is that is that an implicit bias that that we have to have a four year degree for either all or particular? Um, employment opportunities, right? So, so that, that, that's something we can think about. Um, well, we can also talk about, uh, here's another one, uh, ban the box, right? So, so there's, there's been this huge movement for people who have, um, paid their debt to society, ha ha have been incarcerated for whatever reason, um, they've paid their debt to society and need an opportunity to get back into the workforce to be productive citizens. And so um, in, in some cases, folks have, uh, organizations have um, done something called ban the box, which means that box that you check, do you have a felony? Have you been, you know, uh, incarcerated or something like that, that they no longer have to... Um, to have that as a prerequisite to move forward. I would, I, I, so I don't want to go into kind of all the political aspects of that, but I do think that that's an interesting thing because it shows um, or it, asks, it makes us ask the question, how important is certain types of information for the jobs that we're, we're asking people to per participate in, right? So, so that becomes um, an important thing to, to kind of think about. So unconscious bias and implicit bias uh, 
can oftentimes be used synonymously, but they, they do have some nuances that are important for us to think about as we move forward. And so when we think about this idea of unconscious bias, um, the other part of unconscious bias that I want us to pay attention to is this, this concept of cognitive control. So we have unconscious bias, but we also have the responsibility to engage in cognitive control. 